Too many days in the darkness Without a glimpse of the light Running tired and broken and scared But I swear I'll never give up the fight I see you broken and beat Head pulled down over your eyes Every part of you wants to surrender Darling, you were meant to survive With every star We are born again Open your heart Spend less time in your head
pastors here, and it is a delight to be with you, each of you and all of you. Today, a day when we worship, and at OKC First, we believe that worship takes a lot of different forms. Worship is the way we pray. Worship is the way we sing. Worship is the way we give. Worship is the way we spend our time and our money and energy. Worship is the way we hear the preached word. These are all acts of worship. We also believe that we don't worship to change God's mind, and that God's mind about us is made up, and the news is good. That's right. Hear now this call to worship from Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture.
ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until chapter 5 verses 1 through 8 therefore since we are justified by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God and not only that but we also boast in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that he has been given to us. For while, we, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of the Lord.
Well, welcome everyone to the first Sunday in a new series called Uncommon Time, Uncommon Time. Thank you, Zach, for this particular image because this is what we're going to do during this particular series. We're, gonna, we're going to take a look at current events and see how it is that Scripture shapes us to not only read our newspapers or our websites, but also to interpret that news, and maybe even more importantly, to get involved, to get involved in what we see happening around us. So that's what we're going to do during Uncommon Time. So we will take a look at the important news stories of the day and of the week. We will take a, a look at some funny news stories every once in a while, and then some that are very interesting. This is one that I find very interesting. It's actually a story that I've talked to you about before, all the way back the first Sunday of Lent in February of 2013. A man buried treasure, hoping someone would find it at some point, and this is what happened we found out this week. A buried treasure mystery has just been solved. The wealthy antiques dealer who challenged the world to find his $2 million stash of gold is now announcing treasure was found. The chase is over. Forrest Fenn says the lucky guy sent him a photo to prove that the secret treasure chest had been located. The treasure mania started about 10 years ago when Fenn buried a chest filled with gold and jewels somewhere in the Rockies. He put clues to the treasure's whereabouts in a book he wrote. It's out there. It's waiting for someone. Over the decade, about 350,000 treasure hunters have searched for the chest in a vast area stretching from Montana to New Mexico. At least five people have lost their lives searching remote areas. Well, I hid that treasure chest when I was 79 or 80, and I've, I've said that don't, don't search any place where a 79 or 80-year-old man couldn't hide that treasure chest. In 2017, we accompanied one determined searcher through the grueling landscape outside Santa Fe. Today could be my lucky day. Sasha Dent actually met her husband Jason while they were both looking for Forrest Fenn's treasure. How do you feel knowing that it's been found? It's been a lot of emotions, uh, you know, excitement, sadness, because the adventure is over. So who found the treasure? Fenn refuses to say. The guy who found it does not want his name mentioned. He did offer this one clue. He's from back east. Yeah, and his life is forever changed. Now, it wouldn't take us too long to think of some scripture that would apply to a story like this. And, and I, I want to kind of walk through those with us, but then I want to kind of keep this story as we move into the book of Romans. But this sort of reminds me quite literally of the treasure hidden in the field that someone thought was so valuable and so worth the risk that they sort of mortgaged everything. Five people died. One of those was a pastor of a church in Colorado who died in search of this particular treasure. And then, having found it, this particular treasure does, in fact, change everything. For this person, the guy from back east, who found this treasure, I think we can safely say that his life will never be the same. Similarly, there is a treasure available to us that, when found, or when we allow this treasure to find us, can change our lives and things will never be the same. There's a guy by the name of Karl Barth who has said this, Way back in 1963, in a Time Magazine article, he said this, Bart recalls that 40 years ago, he advised young theologians to take their Bibles and then take their newspapers, and then to read both, but always interpret the newspapers from your Bibles. I, I would say the same things. It's important that we, all of us, are armchair theologians at one, in one form or another, all of us. We all should walk through life, a Bible in one hand, a newspaper in the other. We need to make sure, though, that we're reading the Bible so that then we know how to read the news, the newspapers, all of the images, all the things that are happening in the world around us, the pandemics, the protests, and everything in between. We have to read our Bibles first to know how to think through these issues over here. And if we don't, if we get those things out of whack and out of order, we're going to miss out on this treasure this treasure that has the capacity to change us. And so we will go to the book of Romans. Now, a little bit about this, this book of Romans. Paul is writing to the church in Rome. But know this, Paul would never visit this church. In fact, Paul didn't found this church. He didn't start it. He never visited it. But he did have this sort of heart connection to it. So he wrote because they were going through a tough time. And here is why they were going through a tough time. See if this sounds familiar. Long about somewhere around, oh, I don't know, 49 or so, Emperor Claudius decided that all of the Jews were a threat to the Roman Empire. And so he banished them. They have to get out. All of the Jews had to be deported out of the Roman Empire. 
In 54, he died, and all of the Jews sort of slowly but surely started to wander back. Now, the Gentiles, the Gentiles were left there in Rome, and the Gentile Christians sort of just filled in the spaces left by the Jewish Christians. So by the time that the the emperor's edict had sort of lapsed and he had died and everybody was coming back, these Jewish Christians came back to their churches to find that the Gentile Christians had rearranged all the furniture. They had changed all the carpets. Everything was different, and there was all kinds of friction in these churches between the Gentile Christians and the Jewish Christians. There might have even been some violence between the two. So there was unrest. There was some some trouble brewing between these two groups of people. Does this at all sound familiar? And so Paul writes the book of Romans in the hopes of bringing everybody back together, in the hopes of bringing everybody back onto this same page. There was an ethnic struggle here, but this ethnic struggle could be dealt with if we listen first to Scripture and then to the newspapers. Now, Paul, used to be Saul, always operated within Christianity as a Jewish scholar and thinker, as a student of Jewish theology. Now, I believe, along with some other scholars, that Paul was such a student of the Exodus, such a student of the Exodus, that he was never far from the Exodus. In fact, I would say it like this. Whenever Paul spoke or wrote, he was always thinking in terms of the Exodus. Another way to say this is, there's a really good gospel, good news story that happens in the Old Testament. It's called the Exodus. It is a story about God fighting for God's people. It goes a little bit like this. You have this Pharaoh who is holding God's people in captivity. And God comes to the side of God's people. He hears their cries. They are crying out in anguish, and he topples Pharaoh. There is this moment when it happens. There is this critical moment called Passover, when the lamb's blood was was put over the tops of the doorposts, and finally Pharaoh says, okay, uncle, I'll let you guys go. And they get to the shores of the Red Sea. Now Pharaoh's armies are still chasing them from behind, and somehow they're able to get through this Red Sea because God blew apart these waters and made a way, and they got across. And on the other side of the Red Sea, now listen to this, on the other side of the Red Sea, they were a free people. On the other side, they were a different kind of people. Free, no longer slaves. But they were wandering around for a long time and in need of some sort of organizing help and some sort of organizing principle. And so the law was given to them like a gift. And this gift, this gift helped to organize them and guide them around, though they still wandered and wandered and wandered in search of this promised land. Now, they would eventually reach this promised land. Now, this story is hugely important Hugely important to Saul, who had become Paul. In fact, so important that this story helps him to better understand the Christ story. You can see and you can hear, you can hear Paul work through the Christ event using the terminology and the imagery of the Exodus. Watch this. So sure enough, in this new Exodus, you have another evil empire. And instead of it being Egypt or the Pharaoh, this time it is sin and death. Sin and death hold the people in captivity. Hold them in captivity until there is this sacrifice that we understand to be Jesus. Because of Jesus' sacrifice, the captivity is now broken. And then, similarly, there is this passage, and through this passage of water, there is a new identity. Only for us, we would understand this water, not to be the Red Sea so much, but the Red Sea sort of prefigures the waters of baptism. On the other side of the waters of baptism, our identity has changed. And then, just like the law was given as guidance, so now, instead of the law, it is the Spirit that leads us as we wander, and as we wander toward a promised land. Now, this is how Paul understands the gospel to work. He understands it to work against the backdrop of the Exodus. In fact, the Exodus helps to make this story make more sense. But Paul recognizes that we are not yet in the promised land. In fact, Paul would say something like this. We are right about here. Still in the wandering around part. I mean, the good part has really already happened in the death and the resurrection. The end has begun, but we have not fully implemented God's kingdom. Heaven and earth are not quite completely one yet, but we are headed that way. 
Have you ever seen one of those, one of those signs? Maybe it's at the, the mall or an amusement park. I am desperately in need of these little markers that say, you are here. Well, here's where we are in this timeline of faith. So you need this kind of a, a filter, this kind of a lens to read the book of Romans. It was important for me to do this tonight because every sermon in this series will assume that you also understand the Exodus story and how this Christ event story is like that Exodus story. So let's jump in here. Therefore, since we have been given this gift, since we have been liberated by Christ's movement, by God's movement in and through Christ on the cross, since we have now been justified by faith, we have this peace with God. We struggled for it before. Now it's given to us like a gift. We have this peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace, this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing in the glory of God. We know that God has done something special. We know that God has done something historic that is creation-wide. We know that God has given us something that we could never have gotten for ourselves. We know that God is on the way and using us to get there to complete, to the completion of all things. But we know we're not quite there, but we hope, we hope for what what is coming and what is happening. Let's keep reading here. And not only that, Verse 3, but we also boast in our sufferings. We know things aren't completely worked out yet, but we boast in our sufferings because we know that God's not going to waste these sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Verse 6, very important verse. Romans, while we were still weak and at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for the ungodly. Let's take another look at what's going on in the world. You have a pandemic that continues to grip the world. You have a pandemic that continues to tear families apart. One of the more heartbreaking things that has happened here in the church is that we have seen people who have passed away, but we've not been able to properly remember or memorialize them. And so we have watched as people have buried loved ones without, without the solidarity that comes with the people of God gathering around in times of death. We have also watched as somehow we have figured out a way to fight about the pandemic, So the pandemic is bad enough, but even then, we still have figured out a way to find ourselves on opposing sides and fight about it. Man, would we fight as much about the pandemic if we were deeply, deeply assured of this grace that is ours? If we were so deeply assured of this grace that is ours that we could also be assured that this grace is yours too? Would we fight as much about pandemic sorts of things if we were so deeply gripped by the love of God that we see demonstrated most clearly in the cross of Christ? Please keep in mind the cross is not, and Paul does not understand it to be the evidence of how angry God gets at sin. But Paul understands it as emblematic of how far love will go to make love's point. If you and I were to drink deeply, deeply of this love, if we were to know beyond any shadow of doubt that we were loved like that, that we had no reason to really worry anymore whether or not God cared for us enough to keep us, if we knew it, if we knew it in our very bones and our DNA, would it change the way we would deal with the people who disagree with us about anything, but maybe even about this coronavirus thing? Or, or even the racial unrest that we're suffering right now which, by the way, is not new. I I chose this picture so that you could see this is not new. I want to ask us a tough question. Is it because we haven't gotten it right as Christians in the church? I, I I want to ask us this question. Shouldn't the people who are gifted, gifted 
justification, gifted this place of good standing with God, shouldn't the people who are given this gift of grace, shouldn't the people who should be almost embarrassed because, God's, because, because God already knows all that there is to know about us and still chooses us, shouldn't those people awash, awash in gratitude, shouldn't we be better at this discussion about race and inequality? Yes, <laughs> we should. Now, I know many of us, I know many of us are disturbed about this. But even this, even this, we have figured a way, we've figured out a way to fight about this as well. How is it, even within the church, that people can be on opposite sides of an issue like this? My suspicion is we're on opposite sides of the issue because we have not yet been completely gripped and swept away by the love that God has for us as demonstrated in Christ. When you are gripped by that kind of grace, the natural inclination is to say, I love you too, God. And the natural inclination is to say, I love you too, God, by loving the other. Grace, when I drink of it deeply, grace unlocks my capacity to love the other. Grace, when I realize that God has extended God's self to me at great cost and at great risk, there is something about that when I finally swim around in that grace, in that abundant grace, there's something about it that unlocks my capacity to have grace for the other who isn't like me or doesn't like me. I think sometimes, I think sometimes we live way beneath our privilege as people of God. And here's what I mean by that. I think sometimes we are still caught up in, uh, in a struggle that is thousands and thousands of years old. It probably even predates Christianity. We get caught up in trying to somehow earn our way into a place of good standing with God. But when you are legalistic like that with yourself, it's probably easier for you than to be legalistic with somebody else. It's easier for you to draw some sort of distinction between yourself and somebody else that you consider to be outside of those lines. That is the people of God living beneath their privilege. Paul, at great risk to himself, is saying, I think we've gotten it backwards. <laughs> What we have, we have because God has extended God's self to us, and our job is to say a good and deep and thorough yes to the extension of God's grace and life and heart to us. And when we are, again, when we are swept away by the love that God has for us, even though God knows us like God knows us, that's when we find the resources to listen, to empathize, to forgive, to endure. I hope that this can be a moment of deep and enduring change. I believe, as does Paul, and this is going to be a recurring thing, it's going to come up all the time. I believe, as does Paul, that when the people of God take their, rightly, their rightful places as the extension of the mission and the heart and the ministry of God, I think if the people of God will take their rightful places, having been swept away by the grace of God, I think we can go a long way in helping an entire country to recover, and not just from the pandemic but from the ugly protests as well, from this ugly fracture between ethnicities, I think the people of God are supposed to be in places to help with that, but we won't help with that so long as we aren't swept away by the grace of God. So Christian, I need to ask you, do you understand that your relationship with God starts with God? You will never earn what is offered to you as a gift. You will never be good enough to earn what is offered to you as a gift. And if we can just get that through our collective thick head, <laughs> then maybe we will respond better and be better leaders. This is one of the more important verses in all of Scripture. God proves God's love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
did you know that when it came to establishing connection with us, with you, with each one of us, God did not wait until you were okay. God did not wait until you were cleaned up. God did not wait even for your permission. God extended God's self to you and said, come with me. Oh, but God, I have this thing. Yes, come with me. I'll take that too. God, but do you know what? Have you seen my journal? Yes, actually, I have seen your journal. Come with me anyway. Come with me. But God, I am not worthy. To which God says, no, except that I say you are. Come with me. And there is something that changes. I do think we ought to be a little bit more embarrassed than we are (laughs) in the face of grace. But there is something that changes in us when we do finally reach that place when we are absolutely shocked that grace is like this. But when we discover that grace is like this, That's when we can go out and be the extension of the mission and the heart of God. That's when we can take our rightful places to be servant leaders wherever we might find ourselves, at home, at work, in the neighborhood. With this scripture in hand, with the scripture in hand, we go back to the news stories. We go back to the newspapers. We go back to the Twitter feeds. We go go back to the cable news networks, please be careful, church. We go back. But we go back with these stories in hand. Again, you're not a consumer of news that happens to come to church. You have to be a Christian that makes careful choices about the news that you swallow. We aren't activists that go to church. We are people swept away by the love of God, and in being swept away by the love of God, it carries us out into the streets where people are sick and where people hate. With the Bible in this hand and with the newspaper in this hand, we march out to be where God wants us to be. Now, the last sermon in this series will take place August the 30th got that memorized because it is my little girl's birthday. It's coming up. Here is the text. It's Romans 12. You may ask yourself, okay, 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 okay. What does this look like? Well, I'm going to read this to you, and then we have uh, uh, another story with which we will finish. We will conclude this sermon. Here's what Paul says. Here's what this looks like when the people of God finally take their rightful places in a society as the extensions of the heart and the mission of God. Romans 12 Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Now, as I read these verses to you, ask yourself, how might this look? What kind of dent might this make if the people of God in lockstep went out there and were this kind of embodiment of the extension of grace of God? Do not lag in zeal, be ardent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers, church. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, live in harmony with one another, Don't be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, believer, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, I will repay, says the Lord. Verse 20, no, If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. And then another incredible verse here, 1221. And by the way, 
This is about life here and now. This is not about heaven after you die. This is here and now. Do not over, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Apparently, it's possible. In that same interview with Karl Barth, there is another quote. And this, in this quote, I think you'll like this. Karl Barth says, listen, where the peace of God is proclaimed, peace on earth is implicit. <laughs> then he asks, I can just kind of see him shrugging his shoulders, have we forgotten the Christmas message? Well, of course we have, John. It's June. (laughs) Yeah, but I think it would serve us to remember that kind of like we want to continue to celebrate the resurrection of Christ year-round, we probably also ought to celebrate the gift of Christ year-round. This song that Dr. Rieger is playing is the same song that Tamara sings every New Year, every Christmas Eve. I heard the bells on Christmas Day. It was written by a guy by the name of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. I, I want to tell you the story behind the writing of this song. It goes like this. In 1861, the wife of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow died. She was sealing envelopes with the hot wax when the candle tipped over and burned her dress and killed her in the process. He tried to put out the flames, but he was disfigured in the process. He fell into a deep, deep, deep depression. She died the next day. On Christmas Day in 1862, he would record in his journal, a Merry Christmas, say the children, but that is no more for me. He had an adult son by the name of Charlie. Wadsworth, Longfellow was a staunch abolitionist and firmly on the side of the North as the Civil War took root. But he forbade his son from going and enlisting in the army and so his son left in the middle of the night to go enlist and go fight. His son was injured in battle. A bullet went through his back and nicked his spine. And Wadsworth Longfellow had to make the long journey to pick him up and drive him all the way back to his home. And on December 8th, he started the long, months-long process of trying to nurse his son back to health. But on the way back, he heard bells. It was the Christmas season, and he heard bells. And though he had been depressed, though he had been in pain now for years, and though he had another reason to feel some pain now because he looked at his son that he was going to try to nurse back to health, he writes this, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play, and wild and sweet the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. It strikes me, it strikes me, that Wadsworth Longfellow knew what it was like to not be able to go to the funeral of your beloved wife. He couldn't go, he was too injured. We've heard that story during the pandemic. It also strikes me that he knew what ethnic protest was like. He was trying to survive and trying to help his son to survive a civil war. My suspicion is that Henry Wadsworth Longfellow would not have been intimidated by what we're seeing now. He, he saw it and he felt it. And he was wounded by it for sure. But somehow the bells helped him to remember the gift. The gift of God's presence that we celebrate at Christmas. But we will in a small way celebrate it tonight as Tamara sings. I want you to hear this song as we move toward prayer. on Christmas Day their old familiar carols play and wild and sweet their songs repeat of peace on earth good will to men and in despair Then rang 
the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, good will. I'm going to start us off. Thank you, Tamara. Start us off with the prayer of confession before turning it over to Lisa. Father, forgive us for living beneath our privilege. You've done so much. You have extended yourself to us in ways that can be described in no other terms but grace. Somehow, God, we, we live and behave and perhaps even believe that it's too good to be true, that you would come this close, that you would know all that there is to know about us and still choose us and still choose to love us and sweep us up and extend your hand to us. God, forgive us for all the times that we have not said yes. Forgive us, God, for not building, for not building a household of faith on the right foundation. Still, there are so many of us, God, that want to build that household of faith on a foundation of good behavior and following the rules. I remind us, God, that it's only by grace that you can build us and grow us into the kinds of people who can be the very embodied and tangible extensions of your heart and your grace. The people through whom you can minister to a fractured world, a world suffering a global disease, a world suffering a second global disease. God, we confess that we need to be captured all over again. We need to be deeply convinced all over again. That relationship with you starts with you and that we have all that we need and we have all that we would ever want if we would just say yes help us to know how it is that this yes this deep yes can grow us toward Christ likeness and then move us toward the other whether that be family friend foe opposite or irritant Now I want to give you a chance now to pray your own prayer of confession. And after a few moments of silence, I will read a few lines and then turn it over to Lisa. May the Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Lisa. Thank you, church. Um, I am going to be sharing with you our kids' prayers. And they had turned those prayers into me over this last month. And so on the screen in front of you will be their prayers. So if you will pray along with me their prayers during this time right now, it'll be on your screen in front of you.
Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for the childlike faith of our children. May they teach us, Lord, how to approach you with all of our needs, all of our concerns, all of our desires. Lord Jesus, may we feel that close connection. May we know and have faith that you hear us. Lord Jesus, I also want to pray over our children that they will continue to open up their heart to you, that your love and your grace will flow in and through them, that they will be amazed at how it transforms them so that they can feel completed in your love, that they can feel secure in your um, presence with them, that they can trust you, Lord. I pray over our kids right now that you will make them your mighty warriors, that they will be your light in this world that is hurting and in need of your love and peace and grace. Oftentimes, Lord, the children lead us. I am so blessed to be their pastor. And they give back to me so much. Because they are so full of love. And again, Lord, we just lift them up to you now and praise you for the gift that they are to us all. We ask this in your precious and your holy name. Amen. It's nothing like listening to Pastor Lisa pray. And would you join me in the Lord's Prayer as we conclude this season of our prayer time together? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you, John and Tamara, Dr. Rieger, uh, Pastor Lisa. It has been a powerful evening, and for those of you who are watching, a powerful morning, I'm sure. We are so grateful that you've joined us to worship. For those of you who are here and those who are watching online, we are thankful for you, our church family. It means so much that you continue your discipleship each week, watching and participating in these important moments together. And so thank you for the ways in which you, by viewing and by coming and participating, you are discipling yourself towards Christ-likeness. And thanks, John, for your leadership and your words tonight. We are so grateful for the ways in which you are participating, and one of those ways is, is what we would call kind of the, the passing um, of our friendship folders, but we're not doing that. So if you are a guest in the sanctuary and haven't worshiped with us before, could you please email info at okcfirst.com, and you know, Pastor Aaron or I will email you back just saying, thanks, we'd love to know that you're watching. Also want to let you know that we would love to pray for you. And so if you have a prayer request, could you please email prayer at okcfirst.com and we'll respond to that email. And our pastoral team that week when we gather together on Zoom, will pray for you aloud. And we would love to be able to do that. An opportunity we have in a few moments is to continue in worship, just like Pastor Aaron mentioned at the beginning of the service in our welcome. And we will worship by giving backs of our tithes and offerings. There should be a um, screen in front of you right now. For those of you here in the sanctuary, we won't be passing plates, but you will see an offering plate at our east and west exits, and you can place your offering there as you leave the sanctuary tonight. For those of you watching online, you have been mailing in checks, you have been giving online at giving.okcfirst.com, and you can see on the screen in front of you that... Uh, that email, that text message number there, if you want to give via text message, we're so grateful for those of you who are giving in all the different ways, and we want to pray towards that end now. And so let's pray as we continue in worship this evening or this morning. Jesus, thank you for the day you've given us. Thank you for these moments. Thank you for the ways in which you have led us in worship. And God, now we continue in worship, taking a portion of the gifts you've given unto us 
as we release them in generosity and give them back to you, that you may change us and you may change the kingdom here and around the world. We love you and we worship, bow down, and give back now. It's your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us at OKC First. We are a church that is learning to do three things. Friendship with God, friendship with one another, and open friendship for the sake of the world. Hey church, wanna let you know about a few options on Wednesday nights over Zoom. The first is a discussion group led by Pastor John and a couple of really close friends, Dr. Ron Wright and Dr. Paul Jones. It's called The Gospel According to Johnny Cash. That started last week, but it's not too late to join that discussion group this summer for eight weeks over Zoom. For more information and for that Zoom invite, please email Pastor John at john at okcfirst.com. There's another class too we want you to know about. It starts this upcoming Wednesday, and it's called The Cross and the Lynching Tree. It's a book by James Cohn. It's going to be a discussion group over that book. The first class, which will orient you to know how to read this upcoming book, is going to be this Wednesday night at 6.30 over Zoom. To be invited to that call for that invite, please email DeCarla Steele at decarla at okcfirst.com. We're so excited for these two new classes which will carry us through the summer, but also if you're interested in our weekly women's Bible discussion group hosted by Vinette Bell and Tiff Doris, please email Vinette Bell on the email provided here on the screen in front of you. Thanks so much. We're looking forward to our Wednesday nights this summer at OKC First. Hi, my name is Sydney. I am the program coordinator for Our Neighborhood Empowered. We are in need of volunteers to help serve our kids in our community. We serve from Monday through Friday from 4 to 5 p.m. If you would like more information, you can contact me at my email, sydney at oneokc.org. Thank you. As you may have heard by now, the church board and pastoral staff have arrived at a plan for the gradual reopening of in-person worship services during the month of June. Those services are Friday evenings at 6 p.m. and they last about an hour and a half because we have to take some extra time to adjust camera positions and stuff like that. Those services are being recorded and that will, is what will be broadcast on Sunday mornings on the YouTube channel and at okcfirst.com at 10.30 a.m. 
If you haven't yet heard from a Sunday school teacher or a board member or a staff member about whether you want to attend one of those services, please email us at info at okcfirst.com and we would love to know if you plan to attend. If you've watched the video on YouTube explaining that reopening plan, but you still have questions about it and you'd like to talk to a pastor, you can also email us at info at okcfirst.com and one of our pastors will be in touch with you soon. Your voice matters and we can't wait to see you again. For more information about OKC First, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, as well as at okcfirst.com. Thank you for joining us at OKC First. We're so glad you're with us. Thank you for coming, everybody. Thank you to those of you who participated tonight. Tamara, thank you so much for that song. Thank you for the song. And Dr. Rieger, as always, thank you. And the people who have helped tonight, thank you, Jen. Thank you, Molly, everybody. And the people behind the cameras, again, thanks for allowing us to have church tonight. And we've said a mouthful tonight. What we've said is that somehow we are responsible as the extensions of God's heart and mission to help heal and mend the world. Probably will need this benediction, as will I. Receive this now. May the God of peace himself sanctify you through and through. And may your spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls us is faithful, and he will do it. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.